So our next speaker is Jeffrey Kipnis. Please help me welcome him. Um, so, um, I do normally, I mean, I want to respond to one thing that Patrick said because I want to set up my talk in terms of it. He said something I think almost everybody in this room would agree with and that I spent most of my life agreeing with, and that is we should read um, expert commentary on all sorts of things, whether it's philosophy or social theory. Um, and I did that most of my life, and what I'm about to tell you is why I no longer do that and why I don't think you should do it. Um, and the reason for that is, is I mean, I know in a few minutes, um, Rainer will be discussing Thomas Piketty, an, an important writer, and I will be sitting here thinking he's been thoroughly refuted as of January 2015 in a very important journal of economics, and then he and I will get into an argument about that, and it will sound like an important argument to you, who not, doesn't know who Thomas Piketty is, doesn't know capitalism in the 21st century, doesn't know the reputation in this important journal called Taxation of Capitalism in the 21st, but you'll be impressed. And then Luhmann, who I think is a very important uh, social commentator, I would counter with Beck, and then Sanford, Quinter, and I would used to argue about Derrida versus um, Deleuze, and you know, it's true, you can get, you read these things, they are totally absorbing, and they are absolutely crucial to read, and then you begin to think that that is where the intelligence of architecture should find its guidance. And then you realize that Shakespeare wrote two million words. There's now 1.5 billion words of commentary, economic commentary, psychoanalytic commentary. So either Shakespeare was the greatest intellect of all time or simply by being a great playwright and having the intellection of his own field, he was able to discover knowledge far ahead of its time through his own intelligence. And from that point on, I stopped thinking that there was an obligatory discourse for everybody to know in architecture. It was a trick of critics, a trick of theorists, a trick of writers, and that what I started to do was start studying the intelligence at any point in time of the body of architecture at the moment. So I wanted to see everything everybody was doing. So instead of thinking, complaining about Peter, that there's a thousand people looking at not just star architects every day, but hundreds of buildings every day by people that are well-known and unknown. Uh, I see buildings all the time. It's not like they're, we're being burdened by that. It's just a fact of life. So I'm not here to tell you what you should do. I'm just telling you what you are doing and that I'm now interested in the tell it and intelligence that all the architects are producing. I want to not figure out what you should do, but figure out what you are doing and what I can t learn from that. So my job is what Marx used to say about Hegel. Hegel got it backwards. He thought the philosophers said it first and then the artists and art architects or the artists and the writers in the world did it. In fact, the artists and the, the artisans of the world did it and then the philosophers and critics figured it out what they did. They said it and then they got the credit for it. So I'm here to just pay, and so for that reason, I don't think this, the uh, Chicago Biennale is a very good show. I think it's a perfect show, you know? It's a, it's a perfect snapshot of the survey of the moment. Gigantic quantities of architecture intelligence are missing from it. Enormous bodies of work that I know exist, enormous tendencies, whole periods, whole issues that are not there. But what's there is deeply intelligent. Now, you cannot know its intelligence because the conversion, conversion, conversations of intelligence are, are missing. It's a representation of samples of intelligence. But as you look into each one, which I've spent some time doing, you'll find a profoundly interesting intelligence. And I think it's been really fantastic. So, like I said, I don't think it's just, I don't think it's a very good show. I do think it's a perfect show. So, I'm going to show as I do always. Here is a movie that I thought might predict exactly what we're going to see today. You need a website. I got one. Get your own professional website. So, this, in this movie you'll see the counterparts of Peter Eisenman. Uh, Peter Eisenman is going to be the short Jewish guy. Uh, Patrick Schumacher is going to be this kid from Kiev, very smart guy. And then I'm going to be the fat 
outspoken guy with slobber on his face, and you will understand our positions. And by the way, this maps perfectly well on Teo and Rainer. Into the grave! Excuse me. You're not from this village. No. Where are you from? Kiev. I was a student in the university there. <laughs> Tell me, is that a place where you learned how not to respect your elders? That is where I learned there is more to life than talk. You should know what's going on in the outside world. Careful, my paper. Why should I break my head about the outside world? Let the outside world break its own head. Well, <laughs> He's right. As the good book says, if you spit in the air, it lands in your face. <laughs> Nonsense. You can't close your eyes to what's happening in the world. He's right. He's right and he's right. They can't both be right. You know, you are also right. <laughs> he is right. Oh, he's too young to wipe his own up. Okay, that's me. The, a the asshole, you can't both be right, that clearly was Mark Wigley. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you an event that happened one time in the entire history of the biology of Earth. One time and one time only. It's when almost every possible body form was made. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. And I'm going to draw an analogy between that and what's happening in architecture today to try to give some reason why there is no pushback today. Why for the last 30 years, starting in 1990 and, and, ending, and tonight to now, there's just no critical pushback. Not that whether there should or shouldn't be, but why there can't be. And in this period of time, it's called, the, uh, you see it right here. There were this number of uh, taxa, let's call them species. Then in this period of time, it went from this to this. And that set the stage, so you can see it. Here it is again from this period of time right before to this gigantic explosion in body types. And it's best to kind of let you see it here. So this is when you could easily have critical arguments about what should and shouldn't be, what could and couldn't be, but when it starts to do this, Every possible niche is, is available. Every possible body style is available. And from this point in time, the number of body styles or the number of species or the number of taxa has declined. Not all these were, most of these things were really ugly. I mean, if you kind of look over here, you see all this stuff. Look, this was a lot of crap. You know, but there was no reason to fight about body styles because there were three conditions that made this possible. There were exorbitant resources of oxygen, calcium, and plankton, lots to eat, lots to thrive on, and the calcium is important because it allowed for a new body technology. The Hox gene system was a way that bodies could be built out of calcium chemistry, and it had just gotten developed, and then an, un an unprecedented proliferation of economic niches in the ocean. Um, and now, if, I, if you look between 1990 and 2050, and you do a little bit of uh, regression analysis, it'll hold up, this is not just an analogy, it actually holds up both in time regression and in quantitative regression. The exorbitant resources in the world, including most importantly, which is left out of some of the economic arguments of the period, derivative economy. I know you think derivatives were bad because of the break, but derivatives produced not more real wealth, but more money. A gigantic amount of money, not a lot of more wealth, but that money produced all that architectural explosion. Third world economic expansion. New body technologies in architecture are absolutely fundamental. Nonlinear structures, which are FEM calculations, which could be done by computation, even though they were invented in the 50s. New material te technologies. Fast track production, meaning you order it, custom steel gets produced, and gets delivered just in time for your work. I mean, your work would not be possible without this. And then unprecedented niches, enormous market expansion, but this is the list, last one is important. Architecture qualities start again to become important building type qualities, meaning things that we used to separate. A building type quality was how it performed for its client and according to its program in the first 25 years. No one really cared about the form, no one cared about the space, no one cared about the quality of light because of the professionalization Stuff like what we used to call, we call now the, Google, the Bilbao effect, these started to matter. And so form matter, a major change happened 
And that is, uh, especially by an exotic form, became something valuable. You can say yes, say no. See, look, he's walking out on me. I hope you, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I, it was such a valuable moment. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I'm arguing that this is a really important thing because it is important to understand that for the commerce of buildings, the first 25 years is building type driven. The client has to like it, client has to make money, it does have to serve its person. All the subtleties of architectural production are not really important then. They happen much later. They come in later, they're much more uh, indefinite, they're subject to vicissitude in an indefinite sense. Here are examples of four real buildings that were born stillborn as buildings, meaning they sucked from the minute they got built, <laughs> totally sucked. This Teatro Olimpico, four performances, it shut down, literally four. And it got so mothballed, that's why we have it today. This building, they couldn't wait to get out of it. It's the worst museum that ever existed, fantastic work of architecture. This, these people hated this building. They lived in it for eight years. It leaked in it every day. They couldn't stand it. They, you don't even know their name. It's not even named after them. <laughs> and this building was built to cure tuberculosis, which it turns out a building can't do. <laughs> and here are four unbuilt buildings. So these are great works of architecture that were just are great works of architecture even though they didn't get built. So you get the idea that there's a lot of stuff buildings can do that we don't fool around with, and there's a lot of other stuff. So this idea of a difference between building effect uh, is really important. This was a fantastic uh, architectural effect that's obvious. We've gotten better at that. This is not a piece of sculpture. This is not something, wow, how look at this. It actually teaches us to see the city in a different way. So it, it relates to the towers in the background. It relates to the... Uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, in, the, in other words, it cr creates new contextual relationships. So it's, and we are learning to do these things. And, and people are learning to appreciate this. So architectural effects that are more and more subtle are becoming valuable more earlier and earlier. But other more subtle ones that we, like, they, we know what happens when you go down a stair and when you go up a stairs. No one else knows. I think you're changing levels. We know no matter how old you are, when you go down a scare, stairs, you get scared. It's that simple. If you go down to do laundry at 35 years old, in the basement, you're scared. And you've been getting scared a long time because that's where we put dead people. And that's where, you know, that's, you know. And this, shut the lights off in this room and you'll see ghosts. Okay, now let me just show you something else. This is where music is right now. Now how do I get full screen your view? Well, the bottom. Now this is a website called Every Noise at Once. I hope I can, okay. This is the algorithmic map of pop music as it currently exists. In other words, this website takes every purchase in pop music and records its genre and locates it by its relationship to like, you know, so if I were to click on this, you could hear it. I mean, it will play, play it, or maybe the music itself. Don't worry about it. But it'll sound like a lot like Eurodance, it'll sound like bubble trance, it'll sound like acid tech. It won't sound very close to breakbeat, but it'll sound closer to breakbeat than it would, than it would to disco polo. <laughs> um, so, this is a picture. Addicted to the streets just like it's pop. Yes. Addicted to hustling. I can then see the, the algorithmic mapping of the deep trap world. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, this is exactly where architecture is right this second. It is not a disorganized, one-of-a-kind mess. It's we just don't know how to map this yet. We just don't know how to cultivate this discourse. These people do it on purpose and they have, because music is bought and sold, by the way, the economy is music is totally destroyed by this, but it continues to proliferate. More music gets written because music performs another function. It doesn't form the political function it once performed. What it forms is the um, uh, enfranchisement of smaller and smaller and more 
fragile, more ephemeral, and shorter-lived existential niches. And by the way, this is just pop music. You can see this for country music. You can see this for classical music. Google has just started to produce its own version on this, and it's in the, in the Google Instruments section. And it is fantastic. And if you go down to the bottom of this, I mean, this thing is so, it totally changed my life. Uh, I want to do this for architecture. And so, you know, so if you go to the bottom of it, you can see how, if you go, if you go to the site, it's called, the site is called Every Noise at Once. Go to it, play around with it. Now, here is something I think is totally amazing. How many of you have been to this website? This is the Helsinki Competition well, website. Virtually nobody. I mean, that's already interesting. 1,700 competition entries, 1,750 competition entries of smart architects working on a sophisticated problem, a site-specific museum of a branded museum. So the role of art in the world of a branded institution in a very difficult site. 1,700 smart people enter it, and you don't go look. You know why? Because you're, you think you're tired of stars, you're tired of wiggly forms, you're tired, you know. You don't, you don't go look not because you're lazy, because you're inured. You know, because there is no way for you to analyze these inf this information. Wait, and here's what's great. So people tried, look at this. They, I mean, you cannot, you go there and you say, what the hell, There's, I can't make heads or tails of that, I'm not going to look. And so, you can, you go down and you can, you go to the menu and you can choose, oh, if you can, can you make this thing smaller, Patrick? <laughs> I mean, this thing is being blown up. I mean, it's being enlarged. And anyway, in one of the menus, it gives everybody a chance that entered a chance to tag their sites. Like you can, it gives you 20 different qualities, flat, small, wiggly, uh, wood, glass. And I was gonna show you that, uh, but I can't find it. But it doesn't matter. When you try to those tags, when you try to look at those tags, you don't get anything. And so it turned out to be a waste of time. So what I did yesterday, just for the fun of it, is I thought I needed to find something else, so I need to get out of this. I took one of the images, and I took this image, just at arbitrary, and I put it in Google Image Search. You have two minutes. Okay. The best stuff is coming, but I don't have time. <laughs> now, so in Google Search, Google found all of these buildings that are similar to the, this building in the website within that in, in a minute. It found lots of others that I eliminated, but here are all these rough typologicals, and they all meet the ground. They all have very interesting discussions of how to meet the ground. Do I do it on a plinth? Do it, I do it this way? I mean, these are smart buildings that have something interesting to say to each other. It's a very short-lived tendency. But this is the way we could begin to think about that, and I could do that entire thing. Uh, I could begin to reconstruct this. And so instead of trying to tell these people what to do, I can learn from the, from the intelligence of this competition. And I have this competition all to myself. No one is going to the site. Plus, what you don't know is that I've been writing them for two years, and they have finally posted all the boards, and now all the plans, all the sections are on the site, uh, so for $50 or, or 20 or nothing, you've now learned this and no one else knows this. So you can really do analyses of 1,700 of these buildings. And by the way, and so here's some goals. Um, one of the, the, my goals is to, is to try to facilitate new short-term tendency conversations among people that don't know that those people don't know that they're in conversation with each other. I could email all of those people and they'd be surprised to find it because they haven't looked through that damn thing. You know, and they haven't thought the genius thought of Jeff Kipnis that you just stick it in, in Google image search because it took me over a year and a half to think of it. And then you got, and then this is, uh, don't make this mistake of taking this poor woman who thought of this night, uh, 
this is a, the first woman architect in Pakistan. She shows up in Western publications over and over as this woman, this project. Her name is uh, Yasmin Lari, fantastic architect, but she's also this woman who does these buildings. So she's not just giving her life for activist art. She's like a real architect who cares about real things. Anyway, there, there's other stuff, but that's it. I'm done. Time for discussion.